It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Let me share a quote from the recent Auditor General's report. Uh, the government created a needlessly Partner. complex accounting and financing structure for the electricity rate reduction in order to avoid showing a deficit or, or an increase to net debt. Now, we understand that they created Minister this Vagaculture. needlessly complex scheme and it's going to cost us $4 billion, but what the government has not answered is who's going to pay that $4 billion. They like to be a little too cute about that. I want the Premier to stand up here today and tell Ontarians exactly who's going to pay that additional $4 billion due to her scheme. Mr. Speaker, um, as, I have, uh, as I have said in, uh, in this House and I have said in, uh, in the public, Mr. Speaker, outside of this House, um, there were massive investments in an electricity system that had been degraded. When we came into office under the previous Premier, Mr. Speaker, in 2003, there was a system in this uh, province that was, had been neglected, Ask that the there were poor brownouts poor and blackouts, Mr. Speaker. There were thousands of lines, uh, thousands of kilometres of line that needed to be rebuilt, Mr. Speaker. We made those investments. We made those investments, and there was a cost associated with that. Mr. Speaker, what we know is that 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 cost was being borne by people uh, in the province today, Mr. Speaker, and they were saying to us, and they were saying to all of us in the legislature, that their electricity prices Answer. were going up too quickly and they were going up too high, Mr. Speaker. We addressed that. People are seeing a reduction on their electricity bills, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary reducing it. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, that's some pretty clever spin for how you exactly. made the decision, exactly. a calculated decision, to blow $4 billion. They may be laughing about this, $4 billion, a billion here, a billion there, but it's not a laughing matter. People can't afford their hydro bills. So, Mr. Speaker, let me share a quote from TVO. This isn't an accounting disagreement. It's not even particularly advanced civics. Leaders should be held account for their decisions they make, and the government should make it easier for voters to do so by ensuring their decisions are clear and understandable. The fact that the Liberals disagree on this point says a lot about where the party that ran on basic, no-nonsense, good government reforms in 2003 has ended up 14 years later. That's a direct quote from TVO. And my question for the Premier is when did this happen? When did question. they stop caring about the people of Ontario and more about the self-interest of the Ontario Liberals? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, I think any party in this province that cares about the people of Ontario would have a plan to reduce electricity prices as well as Speaker, anyone who cares about the people of Ontario wants to make sure that the lights go on when you flick the switch, Mr. Lily. Speaker, that we don't have brownouts and blackouts, time and time that the cost of that, Mr. Speaker, be borne in a reasonable way. We were very clear, Mr. Speaker, that the cost of the upgrades that had to be made to the electricity system when we brought forward our Fair Hydro plan, that those costs would be borne over a longer period of time. I think it's fair, Mr. Speaker, when government after government after government neglected the electricity system when it was finally upgraded. The banter going back and forth is enough. If it continues, I'll immediately move to warnings. It's pretty early. Finish, please. It's been clear, Mr. Speaker, that our plan does this, uh, provides for the reasonable bearing of these costs. All right. You want to challenge me? The member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. We're now in warnings. Carry on. Cost of those investments smoothed over a longer period of time. We've also been clear, Mr. Speaker, that the Fair Hydro Plan keeps the cost of borrowing within the rate base, not the tax Answer. base, because that is the logical thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, what I can't get an answer on, we have an Auditor General's report that says you are wasting $4 billion 
because the manner you're doing the scheme, $4 billion. Wow. Four billion dollars that Ontario families can't afford, and now in the midst of this, in the midst of this. Okay, Minister Finance, you're warned. I'm sure you don't want to be next. Finish, please. Mr. Mr. Speaker, in the midst of this bombshell that the government's wasting four billion dollars, the Auditor General has still not got the emails that she requested. And so I'm worried this is Pete's Project 2.0, and why is it taking so long, Mr. Speaker? Are there Liberal staffers furiously deleting emails? Why is it taking so long to have the proper disclosure? Wasn't this supposed to be the most transparent government? What have they become, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Can you say that, please? Can you say that, please? Thank you. Premier. Gordon. Yes, thank you. And, and Speaker, I totally disagree with the characterization of the accounting. So let's stop and think about how the electricity sector works and what is the norm for accounting in the electricity sector. In fact, when OPG borrows to uh, finance uh, nuclear generators or hydro, whatever, it appears on OPG's books. When Hydro One borrows to fund new transmission lines, Lines or in the areas where they're the local distributor, it's on their books. When Toronto Hydro, it's on their books. Guelph Hydro, it's on their books. It is the norm in the electricity sector that the borrowing done by that electrical utility goes on that utility's books. Answer. It is further true that OPG and Hydro One already have rate-based accounting, and that has been approved by the auditor over the not Thank you. <laughs> New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. When the FAO was introduced, the Financial Accountability Office, the Liberal Minister said, I wish there was someone at the beginning, a neutral third party, whom could have gone to and get the type of advice and input that would have allowed us to foresee any of the challenges or problems that arose. They celebrated the creation of this office. Now we have a situation where they're ignoring the FAO. They've been in a year-long battle with the Ombudsman. Every chance they get, they attack the Auditor General. There doesn't seem to be a non-partisan officer of the legislature that they don't disagree with. So my question is, is there a single legislative officer that this government can actually support? Is there a single legislative officer that they're not willing to disparage? Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we work with all of the officers of the legislature, Absolutely. Mr. Speaker. Our officials work with them, our ministers work with them, Mr. Speaker, and we, we do our utmost to answer their questions and to provide the information that they need, Mr. Speaker. And from every single report that comes to us from officers of the legislature, we can make improvements, Mr. Speaker. It is a very important process. We value the input, we value that critical eye on the work of government, Mr. Speaker. And and we will continue to work with the, all of the offices of the legislature as we have done throughout our term. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, they say they enjoy working with the legislative officers, yet on every single occasion they disparage them. They say they thank them for the reports, but the reports are saying this is a house of cards. Their numbers do not add up. You even had one report that said they make up their own accounting rules. You know, Mr. Speaker, that, that's not working with them. That is ignoring them. That is attacking them. You know, there was one article that I read yesterday that said, Ontario's war on the truth. The government only likes to deal in truths or facts if it suits their political survival. Now, I don't want to debate who I'm going to believe. Do I believe the facts of the Auditor General or do I believe the facts of this Premier and this government? Because the track record is. Again and again, our legislative officers are correct, and this government's numbers are question. wrong. So my question is, when will this government stop their war on our independent legislative officers? Thank you. You see that, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'm always happy to debate the truth. I'm particularly happy to debate yeah. the truth with the Leader of the Opposition. Any time, Mr. Speaker. 
The truth is that we had a situation in terms of electricity prices in this province that needed to be addressed. And, Mr. Speaker, there was question after question after question in this House from a party that had no plan to address the electricity prices in the province about what our plan was. We brought a plan forward, Mr. Speaker, and people across this province are seeing a 25 per cent on average reduction on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. We were very clear that over the period of That over the period of the next generation, Mr. Speaker, that we would smooth the costs, and there would be a premium attached to that, as there is with as there is with with a mortgage, Mr. Speaker. We were also clear that, Mr. Speaker. All right. The member from the PN Carleton is warned. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned, and the member from the uh, Renfrew Nepissing Pembroke is warned. We'll go down this road if you're choosing. Oh, if I knew who was. It might even entice me to go to naming. Finish, please. Also clear that we believe that it was fair, Mr. Speaker, that when a huge investment in upgrading the electricity system was made, that it would be fair for Answer. not just this generation, but the next generation who will also benefit from that asset to pay part Thank of you. that cost, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier stands in this House and insists that her government is not attacking our independent legislative officers. Well, that same article, Ontario's War on the Truth, said, I quote, the Minister of Energy went so far to personally contact journalists the day before her report was released to say the auditor's interpretation was flawed, even before they'd seen the report. Ministers, senior ministers in this government are calling journalists to say an attack and attack the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport is warned. Um, and for the House, we're really close to naming, and if you don't think I will, I will. I might even bypass warnings. It's going to be civil here. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, calling journalists the night before to attack the Auditor General does not sound like a government that's working with our legislative officers. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is for a government that said they were about openness and transparency and working with our question. legislative officers, I want to know if the Premier condones her ministers calling journalists the night before an Auditor General's report to attack Thank the Auditor you. General. Do you condone that? Mr. Speaker, as I said in my first answer, it is extremely important that we respect and that we work with the officers of the legislature, which we do, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, as a minister, I would sit down with officers of the legislature and have conversations about what was going on in the ministry before reports were written, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the ministry officials work with the officers of the legislature to make sure they have all the information that they need. It's a very, very important function. And today, Mr. Speaker, the Environmental Commissioner, uh, Commissioner's annual report is going to be out. And and there will be there will be criticisms of the things that uh, we have done as a government, Mr. Speaker. There will be acknowledgement of progress that has been made, and most importantly, there will be a direction forward in terms of how to improve. And we will continue to work with the environmental commissioner yes, as we do with all of the offices of the legislature. It's a very important function, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to work them, with them as we have in the past. No question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la première ministre. My question is for the Premier. This morning, we learned through media reports that 14 long-term care homes in the city of Toronto are either planning to move out of the city or seriously considering it. That means that there are 1,800 frail elderly people in Toronto right now that could be forced to move or risk losing their homes. What's the Premier's plan to make sure that these 18, 1,800 seniors are enforced out of their homes. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I appreciate the question from the, the member opposite. Um, and I, I understand that uh, the uh, Long-Term Care Association, I believe, is going to be coming out tomorrow with some, uh, some information about some of the, uh, the challenges that they believe the sector is facing. What we know, Mr. Speaker, is that we need more long-term care beds. We need more support for people who are aging in the province, including more home care. We continue to increase funding to home care, Mr. Speaker. And we know that as, uh, as the long-term sector goes through a transformation to upgrade beds, because that's what this is about, Mr. Speaker. This is about making sure that uh, frail elderly seniors have the very best environment in which to uh, spend their days, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue to work with the Long-Term Care Association. We understand that there are challenges, and we're going to work with them so Answer. we can solve those challenges, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario has 30,000 people on a wait list for a bed in a long-term care home right now. If every home that is considering leaving Toronto actually does, what will that mean for the 1,800 seniors in those beds? What is the Premier's plan to make up the loss of those beds for Toronto seniors and their family? Mr. Long uh, Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I think uh, from the outset, I want to emphasize that, uh, that of the 20 long-term care homes in Toronto referenced by the CBC today, we have not received a single application or proposal that suggests or advocates for any beds whatsoever to leave Toronto, Mr. Speaker. And I want to emphasize as well that no long-term care beds can leave any community without my explicit written approval. Here, here. Wow. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker and, and also in June of this year, I was very proud to be in downtown Toronto in West Donlands announcing and a sir? brand new redevelopment in Toronto, and I'm happy to speak more about that in the supplementary. Thank you. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. The Premier's legacy when it comes to long-term care beds can be described in one word, less. There's less funding, there's less oversight, there's less bed available, and there is less dignity for the parents and grandparents. When will the Premier finally acknowledge the crisis that she and her government have helped to create in our long-term care system and do something to help seniors meet the care needs that they have? Mr. Mr. Speaker, to reiterate, it is not my intention, nor will it be, for long-term care beds to leave a community, any community. Mr. Speaker, and the member from Nipissing knows that we're working very closely together on a long-term care solution for Trout Lake to keep those beds in that community. And the member from Brant, Mr. Speaker, I won't reference you directly on this, but there are many communities around the province where I'm working directly to ensure that the communities retain those. And earlier this year, down Downtown Toronto and West Donlands, Rakai, a not-for-profit long-term care operator, announced and celebrated the a brand new redevelopment on new land that they purchased in downtown Toronto. It can be done, Mr. Speaker, but most importantly, there will be no movement, there can be no movement of beds without my explicit written approval. And we're working with all Answer. our stakeholders to find solutions that work for them and work for their clients. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 14 long-term care homes that are considering moving because the Premier and their Liberal, liberal governments have failed for decades to provide the proper planning to make the investment in our long-term care facility. Back in 2007, the Liberal government promised to redevelop 35,000 long-term care home beds by 2017 so that the residents would have the facilities they need to live in. But by 2014, seven long years later, there were only 5,000 beds under redevelopment and 30,000 of them had not changed a bit. Those residents were still waiting for appropriate care. Can the Premier tell us how many long-term care beds are still in need of redevelopment today? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the 
uh, the changes and improvements that we've made in our long-term care system uh, since coming into office in 2003. We have built, or our partners have built with licenses provided to them from the government, 10,000 new long-term care beds wow. across this province. And our partners as well, for-profit and not-for-profit, have redeveloped already 13,500 long-term care beds. And we're on track, Mr. Speaker, for a total of 30,000 over a 10-year period. And we're working with virtually every community. Mr. Speaker, we're finding those important creative ways that reflects and appreciates and respects their, uh, their requirements for the operators and the business models that need to work for them. But yes, most of all, we're bo both parties come together because we're focused on client care, on resident care, and providing the best quality long-term care for the residents. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's not just the redevelopment of beds that this Liberal government is failing at. We hear horror stories daily, Speaker. Seniors being left in bed for 16 hours straight, not being able to reach the bathroom in time, being left to sit in soil clothes for hours on end because no one's there to help them, not to mention the cases of abuse that makes the front page of the papers. The Premier has a chance to do the right thing right now for the seniors and their family. Will the Premier expand the government inquiry into the murders committed by Elizabeth Wetlawfer to include the broad systemic issues that needs to be fixed in our long-term care system. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows, and we've spoke about this many times in the legislature, that the uh, the public inquiry, the justice has the scope within the terms of reference to address whatever issue in long-term care homes she believes is pertinent to reaching the conclusion that will result in the highest level of safety and security and quality of care for residents of this province who call long-term care their home. But I, I, am, I am increasingly frustrated that the third party appears to be opposed to virtually everything we do and everything yeah. we propose, like the Humber River redevelopment yeah. site for restorative care, the 150 beds there that will open up this calendar year that I spoke to yesterday. And I just wonder if the members from Windsor are opposed to the 20 additional acute care beds that we're adding to Windsor, Windsor Regional yes, Hospital, sir. or I'm wondering if the member from Welland is also opposed to the 26 new beds that we're adding in acute care at the Welland site. It just is Thank very you. difficult to see what they're for and what they're against. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Frontline long-term care workers are doing the very best they can, but they need help from this Premier. We need a find-and-fix approach to this crisis, and we need a Premier that will tackle these, pre these problems head-on instead of turning a blind eye. She has heard the calls of families with loved ones in care in this chamber many times. Will the Premier finally stop ignoring them and expand the scope of the wet law for inquiry. Sir. Well, with the fear-mongering of the NDP, they would likely close every single long-term care home in this province. That's the narrative they're creating. That's the rhetoric that they're responsible for, Mr. Speaker. But I'm still wondering if the members from London in the third party, if they agree or if they disagree with the 24 new acute care beds that we're opening this calendar year at London Health Sciences or the 24 new acute mental health beds that we're opening as well at London Health Sciences Centre, or in Hamilton, if the leader of their party agrees or disagrees with the three new neonatal intensive care beds that we're opening this calendar year, or the 30 new acute care beds at the Hamilton Health Sciences Court, or whether at St. Joseph's in downtown Hamilton, the 24 new acute care beds. I need to know, because they seem to oppose virtually every Answer. good solution that the public and the patients and residents and clients appreciate and respect and applaud, they seem to be against every solution. Thank you. No question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Town. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, you and your Premier found $25 billion for an election scheme to cover up your hydro issues. Today, we have 1,800 seniors and 14 homes that could possibly close. You've said on record you will not allow any homes to move. Will you put that Minister, will you put that in writing? Will you not give express written permission for a home to move? Seniors have lost trust. Long-term care industry has lost trust. 
Minister, today I want you to again reiterate that you will not allow any home to move with your express written permission. Here, here. Thank you, Minister. I will not allow any home to move beds without my explicit written permission. That's what is required in the legislation, Mr. Speaker, and that has been the case every single time when an operator has come forward. But of the 20, I think it's critically important that Torontonians and those in the GTA that rely on these beds in Toronto and in the, the, the surrounding area, that they know clearly and that there's no rhetoric or narrative that opposes this truth, Mr. Speaker, that that is the reality, that I require, I need to approve them. But of the 20 long-term care homes in Toronto referenced by the CBC this morning, I have not, the minister Ministry has not seen, received a single application from them which advocates or requests a movement of beds Answer. outside of Toronto. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is going to the Premier. Today, 32,000 seniors are on a wait list. 20 homes have threatened to close, and that could just be the tip of the iceberg. 1,800 seniors at risk of losing their long-term care bed just in Toronto, let alone the rest of of Ontario. Lorraine Purden, Executive Director of Family Council of Ontario, has said, and I quote, it's always a concern that homes may have to move outside the city because it involves moving a vulnerable population from their home and create stress for the family caregivers. It's an unneeded stress you can end today. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, will you guarantee the residents and their families that their nursing homes won't be closing? And equally, how many beds will you build to get those people off that 32,000 wait list? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We fully understand and are cognizant of and appreciate the challenges that our partners in the long-term care system have. The investment that the government makes towards the capital cost of redevelopment is between 60 and 80 percent of that total capital cost. That is a significant contribution. I think we can all agree on that. But, Mr. Speaker, we are working with our partners. We are working with both the not-for-profit and the for-profit for -profit operators that are looking at creative solutions to provide the highest quality of care and upgrade their facilities through redevelopment so that they can provide that standard of care care that all of us would expect for our loved ones. We're doing that. We're cognizant of the different challenges that exist across the province, but I've referenced one example Answer. Rakai in downtown Toronto, and mark my words, there will be other examples in Toronto because we're working so closely to make sure this works for everyone. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. This morning, I moved a motion to force this Liberal government to release emails to the public that were examined by the Auditor General in her recent report on hydro. These emails show the Liberal government spent an extra and unnecessary $4 billion to hide the damage that their $40 billion hydro borrowing scheme will visit on the people of Ontario. Unsurprisingly, Liberals voted against the motion to avoid having to disclose these embarrassing emails. Will the Premier release the emails to the people of Ontario right now of her own accord? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, this is the uh, kind of questioning that comes up from time to time when a request is made for information, and the government does everything that it has to do and wants to do to comply, and that's exactly what's happening now. The emails that have been requested are, are being complied with. In fact, as of today, over 30,000 emails have been moved forward, and, there's, and whatever's left are, are there, to, there to come. I think the, the uh, commitment that the minister has made, as best as they can, is to have these emails uh, to the Auditor General, I believe, by November 1st. Mr. Speaker, it takes time to do this. It's not something we do in our offices. It's something that our public servants do to ensure that the emails that are requested are indeed the emails that are provided. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time. That's just the mechanism, yes, Mr. Speaker, to how these things work. We're happy to comply, and we will. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. This is a question of emails coming to the public, so the public can actually see for themselves what's going on. The people of this province have the right to know who authorized this $40 billion accounting trick. The Premier has told Ontarians over and over again that she is the most open and transparent person ever to occupy her office. She talks a good game, 
But when it comes down to actually doing the things that are open and transparent, the people of this province have been let down every single time. Why won't the Premier take this chance to show the people of Ontario that she can, in, fee in fact, keep her promises and release these emails now? Sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think I responded pretty straightforwardly to the member in his first question, but, but let me say this about the, the, the other part of his question, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that there are three of, on, of Canada's leading accounting firms, Ernest & Young, KPMG and Deloitte, completely agree with the approach that this government's taken. This isn't a unique approach to this government. It's not a unique approach to any government, Mr. Speaker. The, it's, it's called a rate-regulated accounting approach. It's taken by six of the out of the eight independent systems operators across North America. It's perfectly normal. Uh, if the member's accusing something of being untoward here, then, he ought to be, then I guess he's saying that there's something going on in Alberta that's untoward, or something in New England that's untoward, or something in New York State that's untoward, or something in Michigan that's untoward, or something in, in the Midwest and Eastern yes, Seaboard. Sir or maybe Texas. Mr. Speaker, this is a regular accounting process. It's time for the NDP and the, and the opposition uh, to, 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 to understand that this is a, a very Thank legitimate you. way to uh, account for these New question. costs. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, we all know that Ontario is a competitive jurisdiction where people want to invest, and this is something I hear from different sectors whenever I cross this province. People want to come and invest in Ontario. Waterloo Region, for example, has an ever-growing number of high-quality jobs particularly in the innovation and tech sectors. In fact, Ontario is home to two of the largest startup ecosystems in the world, one of them being in Waterloo and the other being in my town of Toronto. But in order to maintain our competitive edge, we need to make sure that we have a world-class transportation network that connects commuters to these opportunities. That is why I am very pleased to know that our government is moving forward on high-speed rail all the way to Windsor, with stops along the way, Question. including one in Kitchener. Speaker, would the minister please provide more information on what exactly our government has done to date to make high-speed rail a reality here in Ontario? Well, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Davenport for her question and for her advocacy very on this particular question. topic and others. Speaker, our government has been very clear about our commitment to build high-speed rail between Toronto and Windsor, and we continue to make important progress on this historic project. In May, I was very pleased to join the Premier to announce an initial $15 million investment for a comprehensive environmental assessment. And just yesterday, Speaker, the Premier announced the next important step, which is the establishment of a high-speed rail planning advisory board that will provide strategic support for this important project. A project of this size, Speaker, the first of its kind in Canadian history, cannot be taken lightly. And that's why we need the skills and expertise of a dedicated board with members from the innovation, planning and infrastructure sectors, just to name a few. Speaker, the board will also play a critical role in, in engaging key partners, including the private Answer. sector and our Indigenous communities. Speaker, I know that through their hard work and our government's ongoing commitment, we will deliver high-speed rail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Speaker, it is clear that high-speed rail is truly a historic project, and we need to make sure that we get it right. This is a project that will support not just today's generations, but generations to come. As the minister made absolutely clear in his answer, our government is committed to seeing this project through. But, Speaker, unlike the members on this side of the House, the parties opposite continue to flip-flop on their support for high-speed rail. One day they like it, the other day we don't know. That is truly disappointing to so many communities along the future line, including communities like London, Windsor and Chatham that have representatives on the other side of the House. Speaker, would the minister please provide more information on why our government is absolutely clear on the fact Question. that we need to move this project forward? Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks uh, very much, Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Davenport for her follow-up question. Speaker, I also want to take a moment to thank the members in our caucus from communities like Guelph and Kitchener and Cambridge for their, and from London for their staunch advocacy for this particular project. Speaker, on a regular basis, on a regular basis, these members join with the Premier, myself, and our entire team to make sure that we actually get shovels in the ground and build high-speed rail. Speaker, we know 
from an economic development standpoint, from a transportation standpoint, Speaker, it's absolutely essential that we get this job done. And I can say once again very clearly on behalf of the Premier and our government, we are steadfast. We will make this happen, Speaker. We understand the critical importance, the critical importance of making sure that we do get it right, that we do get those shovels in the ground. We're going to work with our advisory board to make sure that we get it done the right way, Speaker, in a way that makes the most sense for the communities that we're proud to represent. And again, yes, to my caucus colleagues, I want to say keep pushing, keep prodding. Together, this government, this premier will make this happen. Thank Thanks you. very much, Speaker. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, MPPs had the opportunity to give Northern Ontario an important voice in the decision-making process. The committee debated an amendment that would have put at least one Northern member on the new Local Planning Appeal Support Centre. That means Northern communities would have a say with the reformed OMB. Unfortunately, the Liberal-dominated committee, led by the member for Northumberland Quinty West, Lou Rinaldi, voted it down. Why does the government continually shut Northern Ontario out? Why did the member of Northumberland Quinty West and the Liberal-dominated committee deny the North an opportunity to have their voices heard? Although he corrected it the second time, the member knows that we don't use names here. We use titles or writings, and I remind the members, all members, to stick to that. Premier. Mr. Yeah. Municipal Affairs. Well, speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the member for the question. I found out this morning uh, about this particular amendment uh, that was proposed by the PCs in, in discussions with my staff about how yesterday's committee hearing went. And it was interesting to me that on an issue that for decades, I would say it's fair to say, has been dogging Toronto and larger municipalities in southern Ontario, uh, an issue that at second reading, OMB reform that was supported by the provincial Conservatives, that at committee over the course of a number of days, the single strongest amendment and suggestion that they could come forward with on this particular legislation was to see if they could get a northern member put on to the OMB board. <laughs> Speaker, I'm not saying that it's good or it's bad or indifferent, but what I know is if that's all they got to come up with over after that length of time yes, for legislation that is this important to the planning needs and the long-term horizon under which our growth plan is focused, then I think, Speaker, we've got this plan in a pretty good place. That's what I mean. <laughs> Supplementary, the member from Perry Salem, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. I was in the committee hearing yesterday, and I said I told the committee the biggest complaint you hear when you travel around Northern Ontario is about Toronto-based decision making. Northerners are frustrated by decisions made at Queens Park that just don't work in Northern Ontario. Northern Ontario is tired of being ignored by this government. North Northerners want a voice at the table, but this government continues to deny them the opportunity. The OMB doesn't just impact the GTA. It doesn't just impact the suburbs and the big cities. It Im impacts every single community, large and small, in Ontario. Speaker, why did the Liberal Committee vote down this sensible and inclusive an amendment? Speaker, why does this government think that insiders at Queen's Park are better able to do, deal with northern housing Question. issues than the people here, here. from northern here, here. Ontario. Here, here. Minister. Minister, the Attorney General, Speaker. Attorney General. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the and I'm sure the, the members opposite know that the members of the Ontario Municipal Board, or if legislation passes, the uh, the new local planning appeals tribunal, that those tribunals are quasi-judicial in nature, and those members are adjudicators. They have a judge-like function. And, Speaker, they go through a process uh, through the uh, public appointments secretariat to get appointed based on their qualifications. These individuals not, are not hand-picked, uh, Speaker. Uh, this is not just a board. These are actually, uh, Speaker, are adjudicators who, with, with fair bit of, of training, Speaker, uh, ensure that uh, based on evidence that is presented in, before them that they make Answer. decisions. Surely, uh, Speaker, the members opposite wants the most qualified people, whether they're from Northern Ontario, Southern That's Ontario, right. Eastern Ontario, like every part of the province, right because these are important to the educated institutions. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier. In her report today, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario said, quote, 
The Ontario government has long turned a blind eye to pollution that adversely affects many Indigenous communities." End quote. Whether it's decades of ongoing mercury poisoning at Grassy Narrows or air pollution at Amjanong First Nation, the ECO says, quote, the conditions faced by these Indigenous communities would not be tolerated elsewhere in Ontario, yet have long been deemed unworthy of priority, effort, or expense, end quote. This government has been in power for 14 years. Why has the Premier treated these Indigenous communities as unworthy of priority, effort or expense. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, uh, and, and thank you for uh, what is a very important and a very serious question. But it's one that uh, I can say uh, uh, the question is uh, uh, the premise of the question is is not accurate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have, and I will have, I have a, a long list of, of uh, initiatives that this government has undertaken, and my mandate to make sure that I take care of uh, when it comes to working with uh, Indigenous and First Nations communities within Ontario. You know, Speaker. First and foremost, I want to thank the commissioner and her office for her thoughtful report on actions we can take to better protect uh, Ontario's environment, uh, uh, better protect Indigenous communities. We certainly appreciate her supportive comments, uh, but we agree that there is always more that needs to be done. And I'll get into some of the things we're doing, Mr. Speaker, in the supplementary. Yes, you will. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. While the Premier's rhetoric around environmental protection and conciliation, reconciliation has changed, the Environmental Commissioner says the government must do much more to protect First Nation communities that are disproportionately affected by pollution. In Amjanong First Nation, we recently learned the government has failed to take meaningful action after repeated violations of the Environmental Protection Act. This government has also missed its own deadline to update sulfur dioxide standards, and it has muzzled its own engineers, preferring to listen to industry lobbyists. Why has the Premier failed the Amjanong First Nation? Wow. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. So let's talk about some of the uh, some of the things that this government is doing, that my ministry is doing, when it comes to uh, to improving the lives of uh, folks uh, who are on Indigenous communities. You know, recently, uh, Speaker, we committed 85 million dollars in dedicated funding to remediate the English Wabagoon River system through collaboration with First Nation communities. There, 85 million dollars, Mr. Speaker. Additionally, uh, Ontario is working with First Nations and, and the federal government to resolve all long-term uh, drinking water advisories in First Nation communities in the next five years. But, Speaker, we recognize that more needs to be done. Let's talk about Sarnia for a second. I was down to visit uh, uh, Chief Rogers and the Amjanong Nation and meet with the community and to hear firsthand what concerns they, they have there. Uh, we have agreed Answer. to a health study. That is important. And we will continue to drive down emissions in that community. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. On Thursday, October 19th, the minister released a new global trade strategy called Seizing Global Opportunities. And I want to commend the minister for driving this agenda. As our world becomes increasingly globalized, Speaker, we have more opportunities than ever to make connections across borders and overseas. And with these opportunities at our fingertips, Ontario has the ability to expand our trade horizons, thereby increasing our global presence. Trade plays such a critical role in our economy, creating growth, which boosts our overall GDP, bringing jobs to the province, and enriching people's lives. Ontario has much to offer the world, Speaker, and it's encouraging to hear that the Ministry of International Trade has identified diversification as a top priority. Speaker, Question. could the minister please offer some details on the new global trade strategy? Thank you, Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre for this important question. Speaker, one of my ministry's main objectives is to help Ontario diversify its trade, both in partners and in goods and services. Diversification is especially important now because 
as we broaden our global footprint, we also reduce economic risk yes. and grow our economy. Our strategy is aimed at connecting regional and local businesses to global partners in order to create relationships across borders. For instance, speaker, in the member's riding of Kitchener Centre, we have a seminar taking place on November 1st, which will help new and potential exporters develop a global mindset and access resources and partners which will help Answer. them in taking their business globally. With CEDA in place, we have already made great strides in increasing our diversification. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. It's very encouraging to hear of these new developments, and it's especially great to hear of progress in my community. I know that local businesses in my riding of Kitchener Centre are going to be very pleased to hear of the seminar next week on developing a global mindset. Uh, this is of great significance to those who are in the high-tech sector, as well as advanced manufacturing, which, by the way, supports about 20 per cent of all jobs in my region. And I encourage anyone who's interested across the province to register for the seminar on the ministry's website. Speaker, it is well known that small and medium-sized businesses are the core of the Canadian economy, and that's why our government has made it a top priority to assist smaller businesses in expanding and growing. Speaker, could we hear more on how the ministry's global trade strategy is targeting small businesses to help them go global and increase Ontario's presence across Thank borders? You. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my ministry's new global trade strategy comprises of four pillars, which combined will fundamentally change the way that SME conduct business globally. Our first objective is to leverage our trade and investment assets through diversifying and strengthening our trade relationship while creating a more inclusive environment. Secondly, my ministry will become a central hub for Ontario trade, thus simplifying exporter services and programs. Third, Speaker, we will develop better research and intelligence in order to drive trade in priority sectors and markets. Finally, Speaker, this strategy will modernize our current networks and infrastructure to accurately reflect the current trade landscape. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Foreign Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Child, Youth and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, recently a report was released from the child welfare sector detailing the rates of homelessness for youth who were raised by the ministry's child protection system. A coalition of organizations found that 60 per cent of homeless youth have been involved in child protection. Of those, almost two of every five respondents had aged out of provincial care losing access to the sort of support that would have kept them from becoming homeless. Mr. Speaker, we seem to be leaving the most vulnerable children in our societies behind after the traumatic abuse and neglect that they received at home. Today, I'm wearing purple to raise awareness for these youth to compel this ministry to take action. For 40 years, youth outcomes after care have been disappointing, including homelessness, jail, early parenthood, poverty, and loneliness. Question. Mr. Speaker, why is this minister allowing his ministry policies to increase youth homelessness? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome uh, the newly formed organization, the Child Welfare Action Committee, to Queen's Park today, and thank you, thank them for the work they're doing uh, to support young people here in the province of Ontario. But I have to say, I'm a bit uh, perplexed with the question coming from the member opposite, yeah. and I'll tell you why. On June 1st of this year, we put forward a, a proposal to this House to bring forward the most comprehensive piece of legislation uh, probably in the history of this House. History. And um, It was a 300-page document, very comprehensive. It raised the age of protection. It put children at the centre of decision-making. and We worked with the NDP and the Conservatives on over 100 amendments to get it right. And I have to thank the NDP for supporting that bill. But, Mr. Speaker, that bill raised the age of protection here in the province of Ontario, and Sir? that party voted against it. And we still don't know why this party here voted against a bill that was endorsed by many of our stakeholders, by the people of Ontario, and protected children here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Again to the minister, youth homelessness is at a crisis level, and recent studies suggest this minister's policies may be to blame. The minister is not measuring the outcomes for youth leaving care. As such, it is impossible to understand which policies are improving life outcomes for youth or which ones have no effect. There's no excuse for this. Other provinces are measuring youth outcomes after care, but this minister seems late to the game. We need a data-informed system that is checking its impact and measuring its own success as a parent would. It's not unreasonable for Ontarians to expect that the ministry helps the children they serve, and helping involves more than warehousing vulnerable children in a system that seems disinterested in their futures. Mr. Speaker, why does this minister spend billions on policies, programs and system changes without checking to see if they are having a positive Portion. impact on the youth they're There's designed to serve? There's your answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is a very serious issue that we're talking about here today. You know, this piece of legislation, Bill 89, was supported, I believe, in the first and second reading. We had all indications by the progressive conservatives that they were going to support this bill. When it came up to a vote, um, there was a divide that took place, and we still don't know why the Progressive Conservative Party did not support Bill 89. So, Mr. Speaker, was it because it was providing culturally appropriate services for First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children? Was it Caitlin's principle? Was it putting children at the centre of decision-making? Was it recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion? Was it acknowledgement of systemic racism? Was it delivering culturally appropriate services to African, Canadian and black children here in the City of Toronto that are overrepresented? Yes, was it collecting identity-based data or was it the word gender identity? Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. Thank you. Can you it, please? Can you it, please? Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, chronic underfunding by this government has Ontario colleges operating as though they are for-profit businesses rather than vital public good. Overuse of part-time faculty has ballooned to a shocking 81 per cent at colleges across Ontario. Instructors are forced to string together multiple contracts across multiple colleges, and many are required to find additional employment just to make ends meet. The government has created and embraced a culture of part-time, precarious contract work in our colleges. The government doesn't seem to get it. In Ontario, we need good full-time jobs if we're going to have a strong economy in the 21st century. What is this Liberal government doing to stop the decline of full-time jobs in our colleges? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the President of the Treasury Board is going to want to comment, but uh, let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that we want to see students back in college classrooms as soon as humanly possible, Mr. Speaker. I had the uh, opportunity to talk to some uh, instructors who were uh, outside of the um, City Hall in, uh, in, Kitchener, in, in Kitchener yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and we talked about the challenges, and they, they had the opportunity to give me some of their perspectives. I have committed to them and to uh, all who have asked me, Mr. Speaker, we'll do everything that we can to encourage both sides to get back to the table. And I would think, Mr. Speaker, that this member um, especially would understand that it's important that the bargaining happen at the table, that that's where the agreement should be reached, and we want everyone to get back to the table to, uh, to come to an agreement there. Thank you. Well, Speaker, yesterday in a CBC article, College Employer Council CEO Don Sinclair said he just doesn't see the strike being resolved anytime soon. Faculty want to go back to work and the students want to go back to school. But the reality is, without equal pay for equal work, there will be no fast, fair, quick resolution. Yet this government continues to drag the strike out by refusing to commit to provide the resources needed for workers in Ontario to have equal pay for equal work. Legislating equal pay for equal work means nothing if the government refuses to support more full-time faculty positions. Speaker, will this government commit today to properly funding equal pay for equal work in Ontario's colleges? Yes, thank you. And uh, obviously, we'll do everything we can to encourage the parties to get back to the table. But I, I fundamentally disagree with the premise of your question. Because
Yes, please. If you look at the 50-year uh, history of Ontario's colleges, they're doing a fantastic job of delivering skilled-based training and uh, education. 83% uh, of the students are employed six months after graduation. 79% oh. of graduates are satisfied or very satisfied with their college program. And here's a very important fact. 91% of employers are satisfied or very satisfied with college. Thank you. And in fact, this very impressive college system actually has received a lot of funding. In 2016-17, the government allocated $1.47 billion in total offering grants to colleges. That's an 82 per cent increase Thank you. since 2000. Your question, member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. As Canada celebrates its 150th anniversary, Ontario has had an incredible opportunity to create economic and cultural legacy by supporting a wide range of exciting festival and events. Our festival and events not only attract tourists, but support tens of thousands of jobs and generate mil millions in economic growth. This year, I'm proud to be part of government, invest more than $19 million in order to support over 300 festivals and events. That's a record number. Speaker, we've seen the province-wide impact of these festivals and events in both small and large communities. In my riding of Trinity Spadina and across Ontario, the government's support for festivals and events has played a fundamental role in our cultural and economic vitality. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she tell us um, more about the success of the Celebrate recipients? Thank, thank you, you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Trinity Spadina for the question and for his firm support of the tourism sector. You know, Speaker, on this side of the House, we understand the important role that festival and events play in terms of economic development and well-being of our province and our communities. In short, Speaker, we believe that fun and financial well-being can and often do go well in hand, hand in hand. So, thanks to the investments we've made, we're able to support successful festivals and events like the Red, Pond, Red Path Waterfront Festival, giving them the tools they need to attract people and investments to Toronto. And yes, Speaker, they chose a duck with a record of success around the world. And you know what, Speaker? While we didn't fund the duck as the opposition maintained, as it turns out, it was definitely all it was quacked up to be, Speaker. It attracted over 750,000 visitors, had an economic impact of $7.6 million, and supported 124 jobs, Speaker, giving a much-needed boost too to the water taxi industry in Toronto, Speaker, because they needed it. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, I want to thank the minister for her answer. Many festivals and events, like the Red Pass Waterfront Festival, have, have, uh, are having a positive impact in tourism in Ontario. The crowds were lining up to see the duck, and I hope the leader of the opposition had a chance to take a selfie with the duck as well. Speaker, the economic boost for our local economy indicates that our investments are effective and critically important for our tourism sector. Across the province, support for Celebrate Ontario 2017 means that organizers can enhance their programming, activities and services. They can offer new and enhanced experience that attracts even more tourists and invest, uh, in, increase vec, uh, visitor spending. I know Celebrate Ontario will have a positive economic impact sure. in every quarter of the province in 2017. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she update the members of this house on Celebrate 2018? Thank, Thank you. you. minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our Celebrate Ontario program triggers nearly $20 for every dollar we invest. Wow. And this summer it supported festivals and events like the Ontario 150 Tour, which brought the world's largest rubber duck and other entertainment to five ports, and a record 300,000 uh, visitors as well, Speaker. Here's the breakdown. In Owen Sound, 40,000 visitors. In Sault Ste. Marie, 30,000. 85,000 to Midland in the riding of the Leader of the Opposition, Speaker. 80,000 to 
Amherstburg and 55,000 to Brockville, with a total economic impact of $11.2 million. Speaker. With these kinds of results and with a thriving tourism sector, we fully expect that our 2018 funding, which has a deadline of November 9th, will be enthusiastically popular. Speaker, the ill-informed attacks on the duck were misinformed and Answer. actually, Speaker, in short, they were a total canard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. No question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Uh, speaker, across Ontario, small and rural town residents rely on their local community newspapers for information about their communities. For many of these local newspapers, their business is moving into the digital marketplace. The Ontario Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit once provided small local media companies with funds to help during this transition to the digital world. This government has cut that funding. Small local newspaper companies don't have large staff resources and could use the extra funds to assist with their digital transformations. Speaker, will the government review the decision to cut this credit and help small local media companies? Thank you. Premier. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. You know, Speaker, thank you very much for the question uh, to the honourable member opposite. And, uh, Speaker, I think he knows as well as uh, as well as we do that we care a great deal about facts, Speaker, and the local media markets that support them. In particular, where uh, we consider the uh, local newspaper sector, which we need to thrive, Speaker, is incredibly important. I'm glad that the member opposite has brought this to my attention. I look forward to speaking with him about it and having a conversation about how, working together, Speaker, we can ensure that these local media markets markets thrive, because in today's information age in particular, it's really important that pu public life and politicians in particular have access to these local media markets so that people stay close to their government and understand how to unpack it, Speaker, and how it can make a difference in their everyday lives. I thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. Uh, speaker, local newspapers are the lifeblood of small communities. They deliver news, sports scores coming events, advertising, and much more to their residents. The Ontario Community Newspapers Association reminds us that the rapid arrival of the digital age has left these small-town companies struggling to keep up. The Ontario Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit helped these companies deal with the new digital frontier. Speaker, again, will this government reconsider the cut to this program and extend local newspapers an important lifeline? Thank you. Minister. To the Minister of Finance, Speaker. Minister of Finance. No, I appreciate the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite is making reference to tax credits that were actually something they asked us to cut when they told us to support Don Drummond and all his recommendations. And we recognize the importance of providing tax credits on the digital media side for those very purposes that they were intended. And that's what we're doing. But I appreciate the concern because we all share the same concern about the effects this has on local media outlets. And we want to encourage them to take advantage of the operations that are available to them, but it is going digital. And there is more and more news items that are going through uh, alternate sources. But the member opposite sat in this house and asked us to make those cuts, yes, and we took the, pro the precaution to ensure other services are available to those same media outlets. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. Yes, the member from Trinity Spadina on a point of order. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would like to introduce the member of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects to the members, uh, members gallery this morning, and uh, OALA President Doris Chi. And she's joined by OALA Executive Director and a fellow constituent of mine, Anna uh, Budreviks. And uh, with them is uh, Tim Dobson and Bruce Corbin. They were here. And I encourage all members to speak to them and learn the group work they've done, uh, they've done across the province. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Point, point of order, Mr. Speaker. So I apologize. When I was referencing the uh, new acute beds, uh, the 1,200 new ones uh, province-wide. When I was referencing the Welland site and their allocation, I erroneously said 26 new acute care beds. Their allocation, in fact, is 25 beds. Thank you. All members are encouraged to correct their own record. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of 152, an act to amend Representation Act of 2015 and certain other acts. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On October 23, 2017, Mr. Nackley moved third reading of Bill 152, an act to amend the Representation Act 2015 and certain other acts. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renio. Ms. Renio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Natish. Mr. Natish. Mr. Fife. Mr. Fife. Mr. Forrester. Mr. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. French. Mr. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. All those opposed, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 87, the nays are zero. The ayes being, the ayes being 87 and the nays being zero, I'll declare the motion carried. Troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.